Good afternoon, everybody. A warm welcome back to the enterprise stage of API Days Live India 2021. We will now have sessions on the theme uh, Connected Services. First, we are going to have a panel discussion. We all know the financial services has evolved in India over the past decades, past especially two, three decades from only uh, majority or major, majorly driven by uh, public sector institutions to private and uh, the, to the entry of private and or foreign institutions. And of late, we have all the big, uh, uh, big techs entering into the Indian financial services. And this is only from a view of who are all providing the services and it's the same across the products and the financial services that we uh, receive uh, or use also. So joining us to talk about the topic uh, on the on the topic, the digitization of Indian financial services, we have put together a good panel consisting of Srinivas Jain, Executive Director and Head of Strategy at SBI Mutual Fund, Monica Jasuja, Head of Product Management uh, for Mobile Financial Solutions at Comviva, and DG Mahesh, co-founder of DG Sahamadi and a collective of account aggregator ecosystem players. And to moderate this session, we'll be joined by John Shield, who is the organizer of API Days Singapore, Jakarta, and India, and director of Blue Connect. Welcome all. Thanks, Thanks very much, Prasad, for that great introduction. Uh, Srinivas, Monica, uh, Mahesh, very, very glad to, uh, uh, to, to have you here. Uh, we've heard a lot um, today already about uh, um, the digitization of India in general and, and in certain elements about financial services uh, itself. I'd like to ask each one of you perhaps to, to introduce yourself first and also what your organization does particularly and, and um, something about how you're, you're digitizing. Uh, perhaps we can start with, uh, I'll go around uh, clockwise, perhaps start with Srinivas. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, so thank you for having me. Um, so let me go first. And as I said, uh, I am uh, executive director. I work with SBI Funds Management. We are a subsidiary of uh, State Bank of India, the largest bank in India. Uh, globally, many people may not know. It's uh, also the largest financial institution when it comes to number of, uh, you know, uh, customer it has. You know, you'd be surprised we have about 440 million customers at a bank. So it's a huge bank and a big financial institution. Uh, we are uh, relatively smaller compared to our parent organization. We are a subsidiary. Uh, and the brand that we use is called SBI Mutual Fund, which is our asset management business. Uh, but we are not small in a business point of view. We manage about $170 billion worth of assets today. Um, the idea of this company was uh, floated about 30 years ago to bring uh, capital markets expertise to every single Indian that's there. So that's been the motto of what we call it as democratizing savings or democratizing investments. So we've been able to bring in affordable investment solutions to millions of investors uh, to India, uh, in India. Uh, one of the unique things that we run is uh, we have about 5 million investors, now actually almost close to 6 million investors, who actually invest with our fund every month to what we call it as systematic investment plan, right? So uh, quite a significant amount of volume goes through every month to our asset management business. So we're very proud of what we've done on digitizing. We're very proud of what we've done in trying to give access to millions of investors, uh, ability to access uh, capital markets. We've also been very, very early to adopt uh, digitization, uh, not just for uh, customer facing uh, assets, but also internal uh, automation uh, that we've been able to do. And more importantly, we've uh, built an excellent B2B kind of platform with uh, you know hundreds and thousands of our channel partners who work with us. And of course, we have a B2C kind of a platform, which is on our websites and multiple apps that we have with more than a few million people you know interacting with us every month another very interesting that uh, you know uh, thing that we've done is um, we built uh, india's first or continues to be the only 
open API stack for called Invest Stack API, which is used by uh, hundreds of financial partners to simply use these APIs to just onboard. Uh, you know, every everything that we've built for a B two C experience, uh, we've been able to take it to our partner network. Uh, whether it's the chatbot, whether it's the entire onboarding of customer experience, all of that has been uh, APIs at one level, and we've we call it an Invest Stack API, and we've been able to, you know, give it across. Uh, and or until, of course, uh, Mahesh comes with a more interesting API mm -hmm. version. Anyway, our, our APIs are the ones that uh, most of our channel partners use. Uh, I mean, I, I'll pause here, but the idea of uh, telling you all this is to not just talk about what we do, but very specific to this uh, uh, this particular um, you know um, conference is we really worked hard in trying to take uh, all the capabilities that we've developed ourselves in house, and we've tried to democratize that work, and uh, we are seeing excellent results. I also work on many other initiatives beyond our organization. I, uh, uh, I co-chair uh, FinTech Governance Council of India, where we work on all the initiatives of promoting FinTechs, uh, largely taking the bigger issues that are there on the FinTech side to regulators, to government, and others. Um, I also work on uh, many of the regulatory uh, white papers that have come out on digitization, especially related to SEBI. Uh, and you know more so. Uh, anyway, I think I will let other speakers speak now, but I'll probably come back on some of the other stuff that we've done. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Srinivas, for that great, great introduction. Uh, there are a lot of points that are actually interested in picking up uh, on in uh, the discussion. Um, next, uh, Monica, uh, please uh, tell us a, a little bit about your your role and and what your organisation is doing. Thank you so much, John, and wonderful to be here. Um, so I'm Monica Jasuja, I head product management for Mobile Financial Solutions, which is now rebranded as Dig Digital Financial Solutions, because rather than just touching the life of every user uh, on a mobile, now we hope that we will be able to do that on every single digital device all over the world. Uh, Comviva and specifically Digital Financial Solutions is a mobile is a world leader in uh, providing financial uh, services to the underbanked and the Banked, specifically under in the underbanked uh, category, specifically with their mobile money solutions, we uh, do about seven to ten billion transactions in a year, and about one hundred and thirty billion in GMV. And uh, there are about seventy uh, uh, such service deployments all over the world, and they have left lifted people out of poverty. So. That it, it takes for an extreme sense of pride that uh, you are able to touch every consumer's life in a way that actually helps them uh, in their financial journey. And uh, I think it goes without saying that uh, that uh, that kind of gratification for a financial solutions professional is certainly something else. Apart from that, we are trying to extend our services, obviously, uh, into trying to cater to more digital uh, solutions, uh, catering to also those digitally savvy customers, including banked customers and therefore providing financial delight in everything that they do. And as far as I'm concerned, I've been in financial services for the last uh, 15 years. I've had previous experience with a network and a, a, and a mainstream B2C uh, consumer digital giant. So it's been an absolute pleasure uh, to be both be invited here and be part of this esteemed panel. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Monica. And uh, now, Mahesh, so uh, yeah, please, uh, please let us know um, sure. about you and, and what your organization is doing. It's a fairly, fairly new organization, I think. Yes, yes, it's about two years old. So my name is BG Mahesh and I'm the co-founder of Sahamati. It is a, a not-for-profit body which re you know, represents uh, everybody who's involved in this uh, in this account aggregator ecosystem, you know, which will be the the next big uh, you know leap in fintech and uh, you know the the account aggregator is the okay consent layer of the of the india stack and you know for all, you know, all those who are at least in india and I, I know in many other countries who are working in fintech uh, will be extremely familiar with the india's stack if you are not you should uh, actually go and see the India stack dot o o r g. Now, India has been, uh, you know, actually data rich, uh, and you know, the goal over here is how can we translate 
you know, everybody who are data rich, okay, to uh, you know, by which they're able to gain from their own data and actually become economically wealthy. So our, our uh, aim, our mission is to see how, uh, you know, the, 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 especially the inner parts of India, you know, what we call Bharat, okay, can actually gain from their own data and, uh, you know, you, use it to actually get, uh, even if it means, you know, small loans. And, uh, you know, in uh, June, about four banks are uh, will be going live. Uh, you know, with this ecosystem, and uh, Samati is two years old, and this entire framework is from the four financial regulators and led by the Reserve Bank of uh, India. And uh, if uh, anybody here is interested to read any of you know of these technical specs, everything has been published on the Samati website, which is no Samati dot org dot in. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Mahesh. So, some some things that I, I heard just from from your introductions, uh, things like democratization, lifting people out of poverty, and um, providing people with, with greater access, particularly uh, outside the metropolitan areas uh, of, of India, uh, into the into the hinterland. I, I guess the the uh, there's potential for digitization to be a, a bridge. Um, but it is also a potential to be a, a divide. Now, India, uh, the, the demographics are, are quite quite impressive in, in some respects with over 500 million smartphone users, um, but it's also a population of 1.3 billion. So what what are, I, I'm, I'm curious to, to understand what are the sorts of things that uh, can be done to help uh, the, the underbanked or unbanked uh, gain access to the financial system if perhaps they're they're one of these other, other people who don't have a smartphone or or are we are we hoping that Moore's law that computing capacity doubles every 18 months and halves in in price is just going to continue so that it, uh, very soon everyone will have a have have, have access I'm, I'm interested perhaps um, Monica perhaps you could uh, start by um, discussing what what are the sorts of things that can be done to help bring people into uh, the financial system? Um, so, John, this is an extremely critical question for us because one is, of course, about access. So access has already been provided, but access without the ability to actually engage and activate the user is absolutely meaningless. Now, what has really been great about the last couple of years is that access uh, has been provided by government institutions and, of course, schemes which enable every Indian to have a bank account and the Jam Trinity, which is the Janthan uh, bank account, uh, the Aadhaar, which is an identity, and of course the mobile phone acts like a trinity in order to enable financial uh, solutions to every single Indian. Having said that, uh, as far as government subsidies, government uh, related arrangements for passing on uh, direct benefit transfers directly to consumers without having middlemen, therefore resulting in a lot of cost savings has actually helped both the exchequer as well as of course the people who are receiving these benefits directly. The problem is, and there will always be that uh, fringe which refs, which gets marginalized because of lack of access, because wherever there is a solution and wherever there is an electronic system, no matter what it is, there are always going to be cases which will not be able to cater to those fringe. And whether it is uh, a biometric solution, it is a face ID, it is a face scan, there will always be cases in which we will be as a technology or a technologist will fail the system and therefore will fail the consumer. The question really uh, then becomes what happens to those people and the, that leads to the problem of lack of trust. The minute lack of trust gets established in a payment system, specifically in electronic payments, it takes a consumer way back whereby they stop uh, trusting the system altogether instead of trusting uh, in trusting that uh, one transaction or a set of transactions went wrong. And I think that's where we need to figure out what would be contingency and fallback solutions that can be made available because India being what it is, it is a huge and complex country with uh, infrastructure uh, dependency on telecom and of course internet access to be able to access solutions. The second also based on access is the ability to have solutions 
solutions that go beyond the smartphone because while we have 500 million smartphones we will become the, we are the second largest uh, country in the world with smartphone penetration we will definitely become the first largest very soon the question really becomes uh, what happens to the smartphones are people really using this for accessing financial services or are people using this to access other needs and financial services by itself requires a lot of education and therefore simplicity in order to take to a digital payment system and that hesitation is where i think all companies all pay, everybody in the ecosystem is equally responsible for creating and opening up that activation and engagement which goes beyond cashbacks otherwise we'll continue to scratch the surface as far as the 100 million digital payment consumers are concerned and third is redressal mechanisms when it's about money trust is paramount in a system when users know how uh, the, the the amount of trust that indians have in bank accounts in securities and in deposits and Shri, um, Srinivas can to talk a lot better to this about 55 to 60 percent of indians actually save money in their bank accounts which actually means that they have the highest amount of trust in banks so um, when you talk about a digital solution which does not come from a bank the amount of trust is obviously lesser so therefore fintechs uh, have to behave in a manner that they if they are not equal to a bank they are not regulated by a bank the amount of trust that a user has should be at an equal equal or better layer uh better level and last i will just leave you with this one point that uk in fact just this week has come out with a regulation whereby and a mandate asking that fintechs do not call themselves bank simply for this reason that users should know that when they invest money via fintech their money is not protected now these are the kind of consumer laws or consumer mandates that we will start seeing very quickly because users have started seeing lack of trust in the system Thanks, uh, thanks very much, uh, Monica, for that perspective. The, the key point I think you raised there was, was trust. And when you said trust, I immediately thought transparency um, because people need to, to trust, need to be able to see what is happening with their data. And uh, I'd perhaps like to pick up with you, Mahesh, because you mentioned the consent mechanism. And yep. consent, um, uh, requesting consent, from, from a customer to share data is a, a fundamental aspect of transparency, which can drive trust. How, how are you seeing um, this, uh, this, this playing out to try to um, engender the, this, uh, this, the trust in the system? Yeah, so you know, to start with, the ecosystem will be going live in June. So it's very hard for me to say how it's going. So, but uh yeah so currently uh, you know it is on the smartphones uh, only and uh, you know but if we have to uh, reach bharat it will become important that they are the, this framework and this consent manager will be there even on uh, you know uh, your featured phones or also in the assisted mode which is very very popular in india okay because you know you have a representative of a bank or something who will go house to house and do the transactions on their like uh, like actual behalf so the your yeah, trust obviously is going to be very important uh, you know to uh, to uh, add like you know what the upi has actually done for the payments you know we expect the account aggregator will do the same in the area of data sharing Okay, because uh, in the uh, account aggregators, you know, you are decoupling the part of giving the consent. Okay, instead of you informing your your bank, which is the data provider, to share the data. Now, in future, you are going to inform your account aggregator with whom you have an account. You will be going to give them the consent to actually share the data from the provider to the uh, you know your financial user. So uh, no, as you said that, you know, uh, the trust is important and uh, in India, like, you know, if you want to be an account aggregator, you know, it, uh, it, it is a licensed entity from the Reserve Bank of India. So, you know, it is from there we actually get the trust. So we know that the, uh, you know, your re uh, regulator has approved, uh, you know, for any anyone to use uh, uh, any of these these account aggregators uh, thanks uh, thanks very much Mahesh. staying with the trust issue uh, i'd like to ask uh, srinivas 
you, you mentioned um, a huge partner network and uh, obviously you're a bank, uh, the biggest bank uh, in India and people would have, as Monica mentioned, people would have trust in the bank. Um, how, do you, how do you ensure that um, you firstly form great partnerships and, and, uh, and govern your, your partner network and then also help the partners gain, uh, demonstrate uh, the trust of, uh, of their customers? Yeah, thank you. That's a pretty interesting question. I think, uh, like Monica said, one of the things that comes natural to a large bank is the trust, which is already built over years of operation. So in, in this case, it's a 200 years plus old bank. So in a way, you've already built capabilities that people understand. Uh, similar to that for an asset manager like us, we are about 35 years old. In. So we already built brand and brand equity, which is shown. Second, you do that by physical education. I think that's a big part which gets missed out in India. The financial education is very critical. Um, and the resolution of uh, you know issues, especially when there are frauds and there are events like that, actually is very critical in building high quality trust. So, uh, so this is very important. Secondly, you don't build everything just because there is a digital setup available. And uh, I think Mahesh was talking about uh, a concept we have called a bank mitra where there are physical touch interfaces, which uses the digital layer, which has already been built. And those physical, which is physical interaction with customers have been done. I'll give you one classic example of how technologies actually come to help uh, in a physical world. You know, one of the very weird things that happen in India is people, because there is limited access to technology, they like to know their balances, how much of money is there in their account. For a very long period of time, we used to have a physical passport. People used to go to in the bank and bank used to write and give you with the stamp saying, here, here much, how much of money you have. And this was becoming unmanageable because you have a 400 million plus customer base and this is just an unimaginable. So almost a, close to a decade ago, we came up with this passport printing capabilities, right? So you could have a, a beautiful passbook that is, you don't even have to go to a bank. The same ATM machine, you just put your book inside and it prints your balance and gives it to you. So, you know, that's where it started of taking technology and making it easier for more and more customers to understand. Today, of course, there is a high touch environment. You can use it on your WhatsApp, you can use it on your apps and everything else. There have also been a lot of work that's, ha that's happened in terms of testing these capabilities, regulatory frameworks in terms of trying to you know, build all kinds of risk frameworks have been, have been done. So events when things go wrong is when you get tested, when uh, there are natural calamities, network failures, things like that. That's when you actually, your capabilities are tested. So you physically need to have a setup. You can't just give up your hand and say, what can I do if network has failed? So what is your backup capabilities to make sure your customer service? Coming from a very large institution, these are pretty natural for us. When we plan anything, which is at scale, we ensure that the, the backup, DR, PCP processes become very important. Now, that actually adds to a lot of trust. Despite that, there are still failures, there are still customer issues when you know they interact with us. Another end of the day, all of, all of that is all about transparency. What can you do in terms of your cost transparency, price transparency, uh, you know, value transparency, how can you effectively communicate that to your customers? One other thing that we've done and the bank has done very well, and of course we've also done is, how do you make sure all of this communication happens pretty naturally and without much of a human interference? So off late, the bots have actually started playing a very important role. The bots have got better. Voice bots have got actually better. Another big thing that's happening in rural areas is the SMS-based transaction, even though they just, they have phones, but they have feature phones. There's a lot of SMS-based transactions that, that have been built. So when I go back to the main question is, how am I empowering my partner network? I think all of this setup, you know, bringing it, training capabilities in terms of infrastructure, giving them, you know, for example, we've given hundreds and thousands of biometric devices to our uh, end uh, distribution base because all our onboarding uh, two, three years ago when other enabled uh, KYC was enabled, it was so easy for us to get a customer KYC done without any paperwork, just with that biometric. So we gave up, give, you know, all these, uh, you know, biometric reading uh, 
uh, you know, devices across the country. And that made a huge difference. At one point of time, we were doing more than 100,000 uh, biometric, uh, you know, KYCs every day. Of course, later on, the regulation changed. It went away. It's come back now. And of course, now it's a pandemic. So you don't expect a lot of football. So we've moved all of that to a digital banking mode where we do video KYCs, other based KYCs on OTP. So I think building all this stack and making that stack very user friendly and more importantly, education around the stack has been the key uh, to growing our partner network. And I'm pretty happy. Like last year when we did our WhatsApp bot, uh, it was such a big success that the first thing we had to do was not just to say, hey, the B2B WhatsApp bot has done very well. How do I make sure the same B2B WhatsApp environment it goes to a B2C? Uh, sorry, B2C has done very well. How do I take it to a B2B environment? So it took us only about three weeks to go to a, a B2B environment. And today, it's a very big success for us. So I would say uh, it's about how do we look at our ecostructure, our ecosystem, and kind of solve for each one of them is what makes us uh, more agile or more responsive. And that builds trust in the long run. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Srinivas, for that perspective. Actually, we have a question in the chat, um, which is about what's, what's the role of agent banking in the democratization of financial services delivery? Uh, so, you know, agent banking has been around for a little while, but um, you know, the, uh, with the advent of digitization, there's a possibility of, of, of bypassing an agent, but who, who's going to, but there is also, uh, also opportunities for, for agents. Um, perhaps, um, Monica, you'd like to, to pick up on, on this, uh, on this issue. So, um, John, this is an absolutely critical part of the infrastructure that normally telcos have provided for the longest period of time, because if I had agents on on the ground, which who have acted as trusted and therefore uh, also uh, available at last mile in order to provide financial services uh, to the underbank who actually have no access to any financial services. And we've talked about, as actually Mahesh has mentioned about assisted uh, services. So this was the primary example in which uh, providing that last mile coverage was extremely critical in terms of providing assisted interfaces for people to be able to get access without actually, actually having to rely on their own ability to be able to get access. Now, agent uh, banking, agent networks are critical to any kind of financial system that needs to reach the people who are outside of the top player in that pyramid that we keep talking about. Because for people uh, who are in that top uh, layer of the pyramid, they will be able to understand and be able to access. But when literacy and specific, specifically when digital literacy becomes questionable, that's when agents who have the ability to not only earn a living for themselves but also have the ability to be able to provide these services they become critical to an infrastructure now telcos at least in africa have been at the forefront and then we've seen the similar example in india with indian uh, payments banks where uh, the, the the india post payments bank is the largest banking uh, network in the world with every postman actually being a banking service agent now there cannot be a better example where a trusted person who you are used to seeing every single day also delivering money because post uh, postal services in India also run their own postal schemes is now your trusted bank account person who is actually helping you not only access deposits but also take money cash in cash out etc via a basic physical uh, device now this is the best example of being able to actually extend the role of a person and a device uh, sorry a person uh, to a person and a device in financial inclusion and therefore be able to take that next step. So very good question and absolutely critical to what we are doing. So um, I, I guess I have a question there about in the, in the agent banking model is how do you how do you make sure that you protect the customer? Um, because from, from and many agents may be trusted, may, may be highly trustworthy, but um, in, in an environment where not everybody is trustworthy, how, how do you make sure that you protect um, the, the customer from, from harm uh, in this model? Perhaps, uh, Mahesh, you, you'd like to share your thoughts. Well, uh, so, okay, over here, what we have is if, you know, actually a framework. So, you know, we, we are not exactly uh, going on the street to, you know, do this, but the, even if the end user has a feature phone, 
okay the uh, the advantage of this account aggregator framework is that when there is any data any data transfer for a consent which is given by the user it will keep this data principle or you know what we call the owner of the you know of the data informed you know in the form of an sms email your notification that somebody i mean uh, is uh, accessing your data and for what purpose so the account aggregator or framework which follows the principle of what we call the the organs okay of which your notification and the audit I, i'm not going to explain the whole thing are the most important actually part so the end user at any point of time in the app is able to see who has accessed their data okay and at every time the okay uh, they uh, an fiu the the user is going to access your data you will be informed so in those terms i would say that it is extremely extremely transparent and the framework also allows you to revoke a consent so if you are not happy about you know uh, see uh, i mean uh, you know for the amount of things we do digitally today i think we can't remember to whom we had given what consent i mean there's so many things happening especially when it comes to even signing up for newsletters you don't know when you had signed up for those newsletters so okay right so over here even you don't know when you had actually given somebody the consent to use your data so when you are informed notified that you know this fiu is accessing your data it again reminds you that okay should i continue that relationship or not and if you are not happy you can always revoke the consent so to summarize the framework has this the feature to you know you revoke you can uh, you can uh, audit all the transactions you are notified every time somebody will access your data so so these features according to me gives a lot of transparency and the most important thing the end user the your data principal is in control of their actual data thanks very much for that we we've talked about retail customers uh, for, for a while I, i'm very curious and i don't have a particular panelist to call on so uh, feel free to to jump in but on a uh, a business standpoint you know there is there is lots of um, in in any country you can think of small businesses have been underbanked um, they they haven't been well served by by major banks um, who, um, who who struggle to find uh, credit decisioning models that that uh, that suit um, the the small business uh, owner and they give enough uh, indication of uh, credit worthiness of a uh, of a business customer. So um, I, I leave it open to to whichever panelists would like to to respond to that. But w what do you see are the opportunities, particularly for um, uh, business uh, uh, business access to financial services? Yeah, I'll take that question uh, because of because of the small businesses. So you know like as more and more data providers actually come into this framework and we will see in the next few months even okay gst uh, will be part uh, of uh, this framework so for the small businesses the most important use case in in this aa framework will be the okay cash flow lending okay and the okay cash flow lending in india is going to be is already huge and you would see in the you know in the, the, the next few years it will be as uh, high as 20 trillion dollars or so it's going to be so huge and for that for small businesses if they want access to credit uh, you know the only thing they have the main uh, strong point or the asset they have is the cash flow lending because the bank's statement will inform you about the cash flow and this gst as we in india what we have you know gives a view to the lender about the okay pipeline of the business you know which is upcoming 
so the combination of the of the two of this and all this information will be uh, you know uh, is seen by the lender in a real time and all the your data will be in a machine readable format and we also spoke about the trust and all the data which comes from the provider will be okay digitally signed by the provider so when the this information is uh, received by the lender they know that uh, this data indeed uh, came from the customers actually bank so I, i'm saying that you will see in the uh, like you know as early as this calendar year you know one of the first use use cases for the small businesses in the account aggregator framework will be cash flow lending and i, I would say it will bring in a huge difference especially because you know as high as about 92% of the small businesses who file gst are not having access to formal credit and we believe that in the account aggregator framework it will change things mm. thanks uh, thanks very much for that um, I have a, a question around what's um, what's helping to drive uh, innovation in um, in the Indian uh, financial ecosystem. So perhaps uh, Srinivas, um, we, we, we've heard about global uh, tech giants um, moving into to India. We can do WhatsApp banking. We, we, um, many of these. Um, uh, global tech companies have moved first into the payment space because that seems to be um, uh, an entry point where people can uh, gain um, uh, gain an, an entry point to the to the market to a knowledge of transactions and then start to build relationships with uh, with the different parties uh, sending and receiving. But what what do you see as um, uh, are the global tech companies and newer entrants into the financial system uh, going to take market share from it, or are they changing the nature of what um, of what services customers can expect and and opportunities for uh, for for SBI for it, for example? No, I think it's a very interesting question. Uh, how do we see the space? I think uh, the space is especially, let's start with payments. I think payments is an interesting space because there was a enabling environment that was av an, you know, available for anybody to come and ride on. So you got all the foreign, uh, you know, large, you know, wallet players who could easily come and uh, set up business and run it because you, the, the UPI architecture was built and enabled by uh, the government. Uh, so I guess as more of these road, ro uh, road rails starts coming into the play and uh, what Mahesh is trying to build uh, in, in terms of the whole uh, consent architecture of data sharing and similar such projects which have come up, uh, whether it's for open based credit lending or any other thing that's happening, you would see more and more, uh, you know, global, local uh, competition coming up. Banking is a very difficult space because that's a trust, high trust facility. There is a physical presence required. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, and that's a multi, multi-year investment that somebody needs to do. So I'm guessing at the margin around, uh, around the large banks would be all these innovations that will happen, uh, where the banks will also work with these partners, technology partners, fintech partners, or even global e-commerce chains and others for example in our uh, we have a in our bank we have a, a very large application called you know you only need one the idea of a super app the super app actually so inside that you have all your flip cards and amazons and everything else working so we we kind of coexist when it comes to uh, you know building something uh, and by the way the banking itself is at a very very nascent stage the the credit market is too small the the investment market is even more smaller so i think the capacity for it to become bigger with more number of players coming in uh, will only go up uh, we don't see this as competition at all in fact on the contrary ever since we had 
capabilities to get all these road rails the government has put in. It was a level playing field for everybody. A tech company or a non-tech company can also now use the same uh, road rails and build uh, high quality businesses. So I feel it's exciting days. Uh, it's going to be very interesting as more, uh, more and more things get commoditized. You will see more and more global and even local in, in Indian players come in. You might have seen this for the banking licenses uh, that happened in the last few years and, and recently there has been another round of opening up that's happening on the payment banks uh, part of it. So you will see more of that coming. Uh, credit market is another large play that will happen in coming days. Thanks, uh, thanks very much for that perspective. Perhaps, uh, Monica, what, what are the sorts of uh, key innovations you, you see um, in, uh, in this space, particularly uh, in relation to um, new business models and new uh, new possibilities? So uh, a couple of things come to mind, John. Um, first is, of course, uh, the infrastructure. Uh, I think there's been a lot of uh, emphasis on trying to create fintech products or financial services products. Uh, after that, it became a more platform-like approach, and now the whole uh, emphasis is going on to the infrastructure, which is ensuring that the uh, foundational layers are available over on top of which both use cases as well as, of course, uh, businesses can be built, which actually leverage an ecosystem rather than doing it all by themselves. So I think that's a great and big opportunity for, uh, for financial services providers, including fintechs, to not only actively participate, but actually help build. Um, Second, I think uh, Srini has already mentioned about uh, uh, buy now, pay later and lending kind of products. I actually feel that the ability to have access to uh, funds, uh, whether it is real time or it is pay before, pay now or pay later, these are the only three models that we are aware of. But the ability to have these funds available from different sources now becomes uh, hugely uh, bigger than it used to ever be because there are many more participants in the ecosystem who are willing to not only provide the uh, have the risk associated with these transactions, but also participate actively in uh, in making these uh, available to end consumers as well as businesses. Third, we've uh, Mahesh has touched on this as well about uh, businesses. I think the focus is really going to be on digitization of businesses because it violates a chicken and egg situation if businesses tend to offer uh, digital kind uh, solutions and transaction um, ability to consumers. Consumers will make those transactions happen on the other hand merchants should find the find the need to actually digitize their businesses because they've been doing this kind of business for the longest period of time and they don't have the kind of capital to invest in another uh, technology uh, layer which actually costs them a lot of money and fourth is going to be the ability to be actually uh, at play uh, not at cost and revenue, uh, but to be able to play the larger game of scale. Because when you enter a larger game of scale, you forget about what you're trying to do in the short term and really focus on the long term. And if COVID has shown us anything, it is that long term planning and long term thinking is what we need to get out of this situation. Uh, because um, short term is what has got us here. Thankfully, we many of us had the ability uh, to uh, relatively escape uh, unscathed. But there are many who have right now uh, they need all the help and resources we can get and financial services should be able to meet that next wave uh, of financial solutions and needs that are coming our way. Um, thanks, uh, thanks, thanks very much for, for, for that insight. What I heard from both uh, you, Monica, and uh, Srinivas was uh, terms like platforms and marketplace and that leads to, to partnerships. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm, and of course, uh, uh, Mahesh's work with uh, Samati enables a lot more uh, partnerships between uh, between firms. So I, I guess I'm I'm curious as to um, who will um, who who will uh, financial institutions, neo banks, uh, fintechs, and other players be able to partner with. In this uh, in this new environment, and what sort of what sort of criteria um, will uh, will the, the players look set to uh, in determining and, and prioritizing who they want to partner with? Um, Srinivas, perhaps uh, your thoughts. So there is already a fairly uh, 
you know interesting framework which most of these banks are already working on so i talked about uh, uh, the fintech partnership that's there with the, most of these banks uh, that's there i mean in fact almost every bank works with many of these fintechs uh, that's there i mean in india fintechs are actually a big beneficiary of how banks have helped them rather the other way around they don't actually compete they actually coexist with the bank very well and they actually enable banking infrastructure much better there is also this emerging uh, you know uh, regulations that's coming uh, when we talk about what's happening on the uh, uh, credit side or on the data sharing side uh, that's again where i think most of these uh, uh, you know innovations will happen and these innovations will obviously be done through these next generation fintech partners that they will come with new ideas new solutions a new way to reach out to customers and service customers and there's already a lot of interesting uh, use cases that we are working on uh, it could be blockchain it could be anything else that is beyond today what is already uh, been regulatory uh, regulatory allowed or things like a uh, simple things like customer servicing uh, we have started seeing a lot of interesting use cases around customer service uh, on the last while and banks partnering with these uh, networks or these uh, financial services providers uh, so there is really no set guidelines the set guidelines are given by the regulator where it's regulated where it's not regulated each organizations have their own way of partnering uh, like you know at a bank level at our level we do our you know uh, days where we have our fintech days we invite a lot of uh, people to partner with us we uh, fund incubators we do a lot of these programs to you know and we do a lot of these discovery mechanisms we go to engineering colleges and you know have those challenges uh, set out so i think the eco structure is developing as the eco structure gets better uh, you will see some better frameworks but at this point of time beyond what the regulator asks you to do in terms of a standard framework these frameworks are very much left to individual institutions thanks uh, thanks very much okay so what i what i like to do now is, is invite each of you to uh, just sort of summarize a little bit to where what you see happening next in your sector of the uh, um, of the financial ecosystem and perhaps uh, or go around anti-clockwise this time perhaps uh, start with uh, Mahesh so uh in, in, uh, I would say that you will see a lot of traction and action in the AA uh, you know, once the PDP bill, uh, you know, which is the personal data privacy bill becomes the law in India, okay, which ensures that every citizen is uh, provided a way to share their data. So once that becomes the law, then all the institutions will have to be, you know, providing a way okay, to, uh, to share the data. I mean, it is not only financial data, it can be your health data, travel data, you know, you know, all of it. So I, I would say that in our, our field, you will see in future a customer when they want to open an account, say with a with a bank or an MF or an insurance, they may also see that if that bank is actually part uh, is actually participating in this framework or not. To give you a very simple example. In today's world, nobody will go and open an account with the bank which is not having internet banking, mobile banking, or UPI support. Okay, so uh, you will see that same thing getting extended to whether they are on AA framework or not. It won't happen obviously in year one, maybe in year three, year four. So you will see that the okay data sharing in the fintech world will become a very very important feature which uh, not only the institutions but the end customers will start demanding and that is when we will really see the your true you know the okay, data and your credit democratization in india and we hope to see and rather we will see a new india thanks mahesh uh, monica um some uh, parting words on what we what, what we're going to expect to see next in uh, in the financial ecosystem. 
Um, I think, John, we're already seeing a lot happening with regards to partnerships, people working with each other, being able to co-op rather than compete, and that will continue. Uh, I actually, however, see that uh, many of the big tech players will finally find a reason uh, to exist in India much beyond uh, revenues, much beyond the opportunity, which is the time size, but really go after bigger opportunities, uh, which is about really fundamentally creating change and being part of that change as well. That's number one. Uh, number two, just like we've had UPI now with uh, the account aggregator and Ocean coming up, I actually feel that credit and many other use cases will become available. So maybe not in another two to three years. I actually look at this as a 10-year game. I think in 10 years' time, uh, just like we've been talking about real-time access to payments and uh, bank accounts, we will be talking about credit being democratized in a way whereby uh, both merchants and other consumers in the ecosystem have a better ability to be able to access and therefore be able to innovate i think we've already always been um, been held back by the ability by the lack of ability uh, and lack of funds and i think that will definitely about, uh, going to change and third is going to be we've talked a lot about this uh, and it keeps coming up again and again but it's about data and consent uh, i think while uh, uh, countries have become very proactive in trying to regulate what data uh, and what consumers can consent to and what they should be providing and data uh, residency etc countries have become very self-sovereign as well the question really becomes whether consumers really understand the importance of their data and how can we educate them so that while uh, the frameworks and regulatory principles can be in place consumers still feel that this is something that is important for them and their entire financial lives and that will change and over a period of time we will start seeing that change as well Thanks. Thanks very much, Monica. Uh, Srinivas, uh, a final word on what you see next? Yeah, I think uh, Mayesh and Monica has kind of uh, summarized some of the exciting stuff that's happening. And I think I'm equally bullish uh, in terms of what we can look forward in 21, 22. I believe uh, digital adoption is a very important thing. And as I see the first 300, 500 million we've been able to reach, that remaining seven, 800 million is something that we need to really work on. So there needs to be a much more aggressive drive to get all of them in this sphere. So it's equitable, it's democratic. Another thing that I definitely am looking at is the extended partnership. The whole partnership network is at a very large play with a large entity. I think there is going to be a much more micro level uh, partnerships that will happen and that will build a better ecostructure uh, for this financial services industry. And finally, pu purely from our point of view, I think the innovation that's happening, the democratization that's happening uh, in UPI payment layer, in AAA concept layer, we believe there is going to be very interesting uh, play like the one that's happening in China in terms of the money market, ability for customers to move money from their uh, savings account to a money market account and not just use it you know, for the purpose of literally like a pseudo bank, but do much more than that. So I guess that kind of innovation will come with everything being as simple and and, and literally free today uh, for all of us to use those facilities. So I'm, I'm assuming in coming days, at least from my industry point of view, we will see the, the Ali, Alipay equivalent uh, revolution happening in India too, in terms of building big money market capabilities for the smallest of investors to invest. In. That I think is, uh, hope that we have for the immediate future. Thanks very much uh, for those closing comments. And thanks very much to to all, all our panel, uh, Srinivas, Monica, and Mahesh, uh, some great insights there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for having us.